WWE has fallen on hard times. Morale backstage is low, constant controversies eat away at their image, and a new promotion has come along to siphon off displeased fans and wrestlers. There are a multitude of reasons why this has happened, which can mostly be summed up as Vince McMahon losing touch with age and refusing to hand the torch to someone whose ideas would be more beneficial to the company. But if I have to point to a single piece of booking over the past few years that has damaged the company the most, I would have to say that it's Brock Lesnar winning the Universal title at WrestleMania 33. A decision that would have drastic consequences for the WWE main event scene for the next two and a half years. But to tell this story, we have to go back to the beginning. Lesnar was originally a successful NCAA amateur wrestler that eventually signed with WWE. After two years in developmental, he debuted on the main roster with Paul Heyman as his manager, and in less than five months, he was WWE Champion at the young age of 25, the youngest world champion in history at the time. In an incredibly short amount of time, he established himself as a dominant force in WWE, but it didn't last long. After just a little over two years, he left the company to pursue the NFL, but in that brief period, he accomplished a lot. A Royal Rumble win, three WWE title reigns, and a gigantic feud with Kurt Angle that culminated in an epic 60-minute Iron Man match that some would argue is the best match of either man's career. Fast forward eight years, and Brock Lesnar returns to WWE, this time with a world championship background in UFC. And this is where the differences between classic and modern Lesnar begin to manifest. He was once a young star that guys like Paul Heyman saw potential in as a future of the company. Now he was a man with mainstream popularity backing him and WWE looked to profit from it. And while over the course of his first three returning matches he lost two of them, Past that point, he began going on a dominant run, defeating opponent after opponent. Until eventually, his infamous WrestleMania match with The Undertaker, where he was the one to finally end Undertaker's undefeated streak at WrestleMania. I could make an entire video about how bad of a decision that was, especially considering Undertaker is my favorite wrestler of all time, but so much has already been said over the years, so I'll sum it up quickly. Lesnar didn't need this win to get him over as a credible threat. Everything about the man already screams it from his past successes in WWE to his dominance in UFC. So instead of using Taker's streak to put over a young wrestler, who would use the win to make themselves into a megastar. Instead, it was thrown away to help promote a part-time wrestler whose dominance would go on to hurt WWE significantly. From there, Lesnar rode the momentum to a squash match where he absolutely brutalized John Cena for the WWE Championship and continued to hold the title until Seth Rollins cash in at Mania. After dropping out of the title picture, he restarted his feud with Taker and began having more non-title matches that were used to just continue putting him over as one of the most dominant people in WWE. Until eventually, at Survivor Series 2016, a returning Goldberg beat him in under two minutes, clean as a whistle. At the time, people were completely shocked, seeing a wrestler who was constantly booked to look as strong as humanly possible lose in such quick and decisive fashion. But it was inevitable that these two were going to have a rematch at WrestleMania. Up to that point, the storyline that was driving Monday Night Raw's main title scene forward was the story of Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho. These two had incredible chemistry, and you could say that they were the two people at the center of the show at that time. So it makes perfect sense that their friendship turned rivalry would be the Universal title match at WrestleMania 33, right? I mean, how stupid would they have to be to not make that the Universal title match? What were they going to do otherwise? Make the universal title match between two middle-aged part-timers? Oh.
This match was a complete lose-lose situation. Either way, the belt would have ended up on a part-timer that would likely go months without defending the belt. This wasn't the first time that WWE has thrown the world title into a feud that didn't need it at the cost of other wrestlers' storylines, but this was still a complete middle finger to Owens, Jericho, and the fans. With Jericho beginning to fall out with WWE after Mania 33, only to move on to greener pastures in New Japan and finally AEW. But at the time, I had no idea how awful this was going to be. I was furious that we would likely have to wait until SummerSlam to see him drop the title to an actual full-time wrestler. Little did I know that this was the beginning of what I like to call the Lesnar era of WWE. The Lesnar era is the period from WrestleMania 33 to current day where Brock Lesnar has been a world champion for a combined total of 748 days across four title reigns, the vast majority of which he has spent as the champion of Monday Night Raw. That means that in the 977 days since Lesnar won at Mania 33, he has been champion 77% of the time. And if we also add on the time he has spent involved in the main title picture without the championship, that number rises to 869 days, or 89% of the time. This means that Monday Night Raw in particular has had their main event scene completely and utterly dominated by Brock Lesnar to the point where there has only been 12 main title matches over that period that didn't feature him. And even amongst those 12, there were four no contest slash DQs, three had Brock Lesnar getting involved either during or after the match, and four featured... Uh, Baron Corbin. What also doesn't help is that whenever Lesnar does wrestle a match, it tends to be short, with his average match length clocking in at a small 9 minutes and 23 seconds, which is reduced further if you only count singles matches where he couldn't rely on others to carry the match at 7 minutes and 53 seconds. And those matches don't tend to be that great, with him averaging 2.9 stars out of 5 from Dave Meltzer, which drops to 2.7 for his singles matches. And before you say it, yes, I understand that Dave Meltzer's reviews should not be used as an absolute consensus on the views of the wrestling community, but I feel his reviews are a good way to gauge the critical reception of these matches. But what is really disappointing is the number of matches Brock Lesnar has actually had during the Lesnar era. Totaling only 18 matches, Lesnar wrestles very infrequently, often disappearing for months on end. During Raw in the Lesnar era, it isn't uncommon to see the championship go undefended three months at a time, and it is these areas of nothing that bore some of the most uncreative and unenjoyable WWE television we have ever seen. And this is the part of the video where I get to talk about Baron Corbin! Yay! In the absence of a champion to build Raw's main event scene around, WWE did what they always do when they've run out of ideas. An authority figure storyline, and the person chosen to be this authority figure was none other than Corbin, who when made into the centerpiece of Raw, drove their ratings through the floor. You see, in wrestling, there are two main forms of heat. Normal heat is when the bad guy or heel gets the audience mad at them through their words or conduct in a way that makes people enraged and excited to see them get comeuppance. That's not what Corbin got. Instead, he got go away heat, which is when the audience reacts with either indifference at a heel's attempt to get heat or anger directed at the poor quality of the storyline. And as Raw's temporary general manager, Corbin oversaturated the show with him and his poorly put together band of heels constantly beating up on many of the wrestlers that the WWE audience felt were underrepresented. And these constant failed attempts at heat drove away fans and 
droves, which led to record low ratings as people simply did not want to see this storyline between the tired and overdone authority figure gimmick and the inability of Corbin to carry Raw's main event scene. And it was Lesnar's absence with the championship that helped make such an awful storyline possible. Going back to the idea of heat though, I want to discuss a particular storyline involving Brock Lesnar that shows how poorly he functions as a character. Going into WrestleMania 34, it was assumed that Lesnar would drop the belt to Roman Reigns. Reigns was a controversial babyface that WWE heavily pushed despite clear audience backlash against him. He was essentially the golden boy of WWE at the time and seemed like the obvious choice to end Lesnar's almost year-long title reign. The two had previous history and Roman never got his big win against Brock, so the story seemed to be that Roman's victory over Lesnar would further establish him as the new face of the company. Lesnar's contract was also running out right after Mania and a potential return to UFC was looming in the background. As much as the audience would hate it, Roman was definitely for victory, and the title was going to end up back in the hands of a full-time wrestler. But then, something strange happened. As their match went on, Roman kicked out of finisher after finisher until after 6 F5s in total, Roman lost. This result surprised everyone and pleased nobody. For those who disliked Roman, seeing him kick out of a finisher that up to that point in the Lesnar era nobody kicked out of, and then watching as he proceeded to do it again and again was infuriating. Any wrestler that had lost to Lesnar up to this point looked like a complete joke. And for those who disliked Brock, this was an extension of his already year-long title reign. It was a confusing mess that ended up burying the entire roster in the process. Over the next few months, Lesnar barely showed up to Raw, something that people weren't unused to, but it was at a boiling point as Lesnar surpassed fan favorite CM Punk's record for longest modern world title reign, despite wrestling nowhere near as many matches. However, WWE seemed to be aware of people's growing annoyance and began portraying Lesnar as a lazy, selfish jerk that couldn't be bothered to even walk to the ring, with Paul Heyman having to beg him to do so under a contractual obligation. He showed complete indifference to not just the fans, but the wrestling industry as a whole. This was an attempt to take the image fans had of Lesnar and generate genuine heat off of it. And at SummerSlam, after waiting forever, fans finally got to see Lesnar drop the belt, which sounds like it should have been an amazing moment, but something about the situation fell off. Instead of Roman Reigns beating Lesnar fairly, he had to rely on a distraction from Braun Strowman, which was far from the cathartic ass beating that Lesnar felt like he deserved at that point. It didn't really elevate Reigns at all and simply protected Lesnar from having to face an actual loss. And then just two months later, Lesnar inserted himself back into the title picture and won the Universal Championship, simply starting the whole situation over again. Instead of Reigns his win being a return to form, it was a small detour from Lesnar being champion. And when I said Lesnar fails as a character before, this is what I mean. He is a heel that never truly gets his comeuppance. He almost always wins, and even when he doesn't, there's often a convenient excuse that removes most of the embarrassment of the situation. Then he simply comes back a few months later, and the Lesnar era resumes. And it's even worse when you think about how WWE WWE directly acknowledged the issues people had with Lesnar. They had guys like Kurt Angle and Reigns call Lesnar out for not being a fighting champion, only to continue booking him as a champion still to this day. It's WWE trying to have its cake and eat it too by telling fans that they hear their criticisms, but then doing absolutely nothing to actually address said criticism. And this really made me and a lot of other people question why they were fans of a product that so clearly didn't value their opinions. And all of this makes me think about a time when WWE weren't like this. And that time is... 
The Attitude Era. The Attitude Era can be characterized as a time of great change in WWE, where they began to embrace a more anti-authoritarian image as a wave of newer faces came along to define a new period in wrestling history. Among some of the WWE champions of that era are Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Mankind, Kurt Angle, and Triple H, all of whom went on to become icons of the industry that many of today's wrestlers are measured against. And part of what allowed for these wrestlers to get so over with the fans was the ever-changing title picture as reigns were never that long, with there being 20 different title reigns between Austin winning the title at WrestleMania 14 and Kurt Angle winning it at No Mercy around two and a half years later. And while this might be looked at as a bit too hectic, it worked with the energetic fan base of the Attitude Era who loved the unpredictability of turning on Monday Night Raw and not knowing if you'd still have the same champion at the end of the night, with six of these title changes happening on TV. Now, hypothetically, imagine what would happen if we took the Attitude Era and dropped modern-day Brock Lesnar into it with the same work schedule and time as champion. All the praise that I gave the Attitude Era would vanish instantly with guys like Austin and Rock never getting the chance to get over with fans. The exciting back-and-forth nature of the WWE WWE title scene would give way to a predictable series of occasional pay-per-view matches that Lesnar would almost always win. And those six Raw title changes would be non-existent since Lesnar doesn't wrestle TV matches, with his only one during the Lesnar era being less than 10 seconds. If Lesnar had been around during the Attitude Era, there wouldn't have been an Attitude Era. And that really makes me sad, because you could argue WWE WWE has more talent in their promotion than they ever have, with many excellent wrestlers under contract to them. But the glass ceiling generated by Lesnar is almost impossible to get past, with only two people managing to break through. These are the conditions that has led to unhappiness on both sides of the ring ropes, as fans have almost nobody to push for at the top of the card, and wrestlers are left disappointed that their careers have taken downturns since joining WWE. And this has given rise to AEW, which seeks to become a home for wrestlers and fans who have become disillusioned with the current state of WWE, with their executive vice president referring to the promotion as Ellis Island. And we can see that in how they've booked their wrestlers. As mentioned earlier, Jericho went from being forced to play second fiddle to Lesnar and Goldberg to joining AEW, where he is now a champion on one of the the best runs of his career. Dustin Rhodes went from a man who was barely wrestling for WWE to having his first five-star match at the age of 50. And the clearest example of all being the rise of John Moxley, formerly Dean Ambrose of WWE, who went from being so depressed at his lack of creative freedom that he could barely get out of bed in the morning to an absolute megastar. AEW isn't just a good place for former WWE stars to get some well-needed freedom, though. It is also a place where younger stars are being made, with guys like MJF cutting promos alongside Chris Jericho at the age of 23. Where WWE has failed, AEW is thriving. Before I wrap this video up, though, I want to talk about two more wrestlers. The first being the biggest example of failing to get through life. Lesnar's glass ceiling, Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman was once a member of the Wyatt family faction until he was separated from them and given a singles push that saw him violently tear through the roster with ridiculous feats of strength that brought a wild and unpredictable nature back to Raw that reminded people of the Attitude Era. At his peak, Strowman was probably the single most over person in the company with fans absolutely loving him. But instead of riding this momentum to a title win, he, like many others, ate a single F5 from Brock Lesnar and lost in under 10 minutes. Since then, Braun Strowman has failed to capture the title time and time again, and he is far past the peak in popularity he once had. It didn't matter how strong they tried to make him look, without a title run, there was nothing to really cement him at the top of the company, and so people lost interest. And now the man who once 
once looked like one of the future faces of the company has been reduced to wrestling celebrities like a modern day big show. Then there is the final wrestler I want to discuss, and that's... Brock Lesnar, but not the one we have been talking about throughout the video. I'm talking about the one at the beginning, the young man in 2002 who was given an opportunity by WWE to make a name for himself and rode that opportunity to a career that's garnered him millions of dollars and championships across WWE and UFC. Now, what would happen if we took that man and put him across the ring with his future self? At this point, I think we all know what would happen. Hello everyone, just want to say thank you for watching the video and thank you to everyone who watched my previous two videos and subscribed. It means the world to me and if you're interested in my content, feel free to subscribe. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to just leave them in the comments below.